In this video, we're going to talk about algorithmic bias. We're going to start with a lighter example to kind of showcase what we mean by algorithmic bias. And then we're going to talk more about uh, concerns of more societal importance in terms of well, where these algorithms are being used and how bias is actually affecting uh, members of our society and doing so differently for different uh, groups of the, uh, the society. So uh, the first one, the first example is the Hathaway effect. This is uh, from a, a Huffington Post article from back in 2011, where um, the uh, journalist uh, wrote this piece called The Hathaway Effect, How Anne Gives Warren Buffett a Rise. And so what we have here is uh, the, the company Berkshire Hathaway, basically, who, which shares the same last name uh, or the same name as Anne Hathaway. And what they did was a kind of a um, retrospective analysis of looking at certain time points. Uh, for example, October 3rd, 2018 was uh, when Rachel Getting Married, a movie that Anne Hathaway is in, opened. And then Berkshire Hathaway stock went up. And similarly, in in 2009, Bride Wars, Valentine's Day, Alice in Wonderland, Love and Other Drugs, and um, also in 2010 when uh, Anne Hathaway was announced as co-host of the Oscars. So at each one of these time points, Berkshire Hathaway stuck went up a little bit. Now, um, obviously, this is a um, kind of an observational uh, look at what happened. But I think the supposition in the article was that, well, maybe people are searching more for Anne Hathaway, but they are searching for the word Hathaway. But then if in some way the search results are affecting popularity um, of results that are being uh, surfaced up and then hence potentially having a downstream effect on the stock prices as well, the article basically explores, is there a relationship? between these two. Um, I'll let you read the article and decide for yourself. It doesn't seem like there's like a huge concrete evidence for this in some way, but one can somehow see how um, influencing the search results could then have other influence on other aspects. And in this case, it happened to stem from a shared name, but obviously so those sorts of links can be much more subtle as well. Um, so let's take a look at another example in terms of algorithmic bias and gender. The first example here comes from Google Translate. So Google Translate obviously just does translation, right? Uh, you could be looking these things up in a dictionary as well, but there's more to it. It actually can translate sentences, in which case it needs to have some handle on the natural language. So here on the left, we have uh, sentences from, or sentence fragments from Turkish. Um, and then on the right, we have sentence fragments from English. Now in Turkish, the third uh, pronoun is genderless. So we don't have he or she in Turkish. It's um, similar to it, but it doesn't have a, a kind of a non-gendered connotation either. It's just O is the, um, is the word, and it is not associated with either gender. So the first, um, a uh, batch of uh, sentences there, obir asker, obir aritman, translate to blah is a soldier, blah is a teacher. But you can see that while in Turkish the same pronouns were used for soldier and teacher, we're seeing that on the English translation, the soldier is associated with a he and the teacher is associated with a she. This is probably happening because of the data that the Google Translate is being trained on, which probably depends on, you know, whatever data is out there. So if whatever data is out there, teachers are more associated with being female and soldiers are more associated with being male, then that basically is the data on which the system is learning and then it's basically parroting it back to you. But you can also see further down uh, some things where um, perhaps the uh, it's, it's unclear where, why these gender decisions are being made. So for example, he's a rector, he's a president, he's an entrepreneur, but she's a singer, he is a student, he is a translator. And then if we keep going down, he is hardworking, she is lazy. Um, he is a painter, 
he is a hairdresser, he is a waiter. So we're seeing that um, depending on uh, certain kind of connotations about jobs, we're doing a he or a she assignment, but what about hardworking and lazy? There's absolutely no reason those should be associated with a particular gender. So these sorts of issues uh, routinely get uh, picked up um, in, and pointed out to systems like Google Translate and then um, the People working on the background of this, the data scientists, the engineers will try to correct for these. And then sometimes they uh, tend to seep back up again, because if we're not necessarily, if we're just letting these algorithms learn on their own from the data and the data itself is biased, they're going to be parroting back that bias to us. Here's another example of where that uh, biased data in basically ends up uh, building a system that is biased as well. So this was Amazon's experimental hiring algorithm. Uh, back in 2018, there was some news about this hiring algorithm. So what Amazon did was to use AI, artificial intelligence, to give job candidates scores ranging from one to five stars. So, you know, you apply for a job at Amazon, they look through your documentation. So instead of a human reading it, the system reads it and then just like uh, you get to rate products on Amazon, the system rated uh, you as a job candidate. But Amazon's system was not rating candidates for software developer jobs and other technical posts in a gender neutral way. It taught itself that male candidates were preferable. Why? Because that's who Amazon had on hire to begin with. So if the system is learning on who is already there, then it's going to keep perpetuating who is already there. And in this article, uh, here's a quote from the article um, on Reuters, gender bias was not the only issue. Problems with the data that underpinned the model's judgments meant that unqualified candidates were often recommended for all manner of jobs that people said. So we're basically seeing that um, it, the algorithm is picking up on certain features and not necessarily um, kind of considering the human as a whole. And in addition, it's perpetuating the bias that already exists in the data that went into building this system. The next example is about algorithmic bias and race. Uh, here's an article from The Guardian from 2017, uh, an interview with Joy Bulamwini, who is a graduate researcher at the MIT Media Lab, and she's also the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, um, and about her experience working with facial recognition and computer vision systems, and how she realized that these systems were trained mostly on white faces, and hence they did not do as good a job basically recognizing uh, patterns in non-white faces. So um, instead of me telling a whole lot about this story, what I've actually done is link to a video, uh, one of her TED Talks uh, about the issue so that you can get a better, better understanding of kind of the, both the research that she was working on and then the findings, especially um, around this. But what you'll see in the video is that when she actually puts on a white mask, uh, which, you know, has basically almost no real human facial features, but kind of looks like it, um, the algorithm was doing a lot better in picking up um, the uh, facial features than when she wasn't wearing that, which seems entirely counterintuitive. But it is another example of how the algorithm is ultimately not perceiving uh, things as a human would, and it's basically only perpetuating uh, what it knows from the training data that went into it. Um, another example of this um, racial uh, kind of uh, algorithmic bias and race comes in criminal sentencing. So this is an article from uh, ProPublica uh, published back in 2016, um, and it was titled Machine Bias, the article, and the subtitle said, there's software used across the country to predict future criminals and it's biased against blacks. So I want to delve a little bit into this article here. Um, here we have two pictures, a white male and a black female. And uh, one of them was labeled uh, low risk, the white male, and the other one was uh, labeled high risk. So when we're thinking about risk here, what they're talking about is would they uh, commit a crime again? So these were both uh, petty theft arrests. So uh, Borden, uh, Brisha Borden was rated high risk for future crime after she and a friend took a kid's bike and scooter that were sitting outside. She didn't actually reoffend, but she was labeled that. So let's take a look at the um, at the detail about this. Um, 
the white male, Vernon Prater, had uh, prior offenses, so two armed robberies and one attempted uh, armed robbery, and actually had a subsequent offense as well. So she, he did actually offend again, one grand theft. But the algorithm at the time classified him as low risk, uh, while Brisha Borden had four juvenile misdemeanors and no subsequent uh, offenses. Uh, but the algorithm at the time labeled her as high risk. Given these two stories of prior offenses, to a human you might be thinking, why would this be the case? But we have to realize that it is not a human basically considering this whole thing, um, uh, considering the complete uh, story, but instead we have an algorithm who's making these decisions and the algorithm is trained on biased data to begin with. So here's a quote from the then uh, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, where he says, although these measures were crafted with the best of intentions, I am concerned that they, are inadvertent, that they inadvertently undermine our efforts to ensure individualized and equal justice, he said, adding, they may, they may exasperate unwarranted and unjust disparities that are already far too common in our criminal justice system and in our society. So here we're seeing another example of this bias being perpetuated throughout. So let's take a look at the data. Uh, so ProPublica did the analysis and they looked at risk scores assigned to more than 7,000 people arrested in a county in Florida, Broward County in Florida in 2013 and 2014. And they also looked at whether they were charged with new crimes over the next two years. So we have then the uh, future data, if you will, on did they have subsequent offenses. And the results, 20% of those predicted to commit violent crimes actually did. An algorithm had higher accuracy, so 61%, when full range of crimes were taken into account, so misdemeanors as well. But let's take a look at the two rows here in this table. We have labeled high risk, but didn't reoffend. And let's take a look at the proportions for white versus African American. 23.5% for white, 44.9% for African American, labeled lower risk yet did reoffend. Um, for the whites, that uh, that proportion is a lot higher than for African Americans, 47.7% versus 28%. So what we're seeing here is that the algorithm was more likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals at almost twice the rate as white defendants. And remember that this does end up then being factored into other decisions about these uh, people. So it is not just some prediction that sits there for um, you know, some sort of scientific reason. Actual decisions are being made about the liberties of these people. And white defendants were mislabeled as low risk more often than black defendants. So uh, this particular article from ProPublica basically drew a lot of attention to what was happening Happening with these uh, automated systems that were, as Eric Holder said, potentially built with the best of intentions to make things more efficient. And sometimes we think about such algorithms as almost making things more fair as well, in the sense that we might be thinking we're not going to bring human biases or implicit biases into the mix. We're just going to let a machine decide, but a machine isn't actually doing the deciding. The data that goes into it is what's training the machine. And then the people who are building these algorithms, if they're not paying attention to these biases, being perpetuated ultimately are inflicting their implicit biases or explicit biases into these algorithms as well. Um, here's a, a great blog post by uh, Thomas Lumley, who uh, wrote about how to write a racist AI in R without really trying. And actually, he refers to a blog post uh, by Robin Spear, who the year prior to uh, Thomas writing this, um, wrote a very similar article in Python. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing the implementation in another language, you can click through to that as well. So that's the inspiration for this post, but I'll walk you through the, uh, the R blog post here. So the idea here is to do sentiment analysis with obvious off-the-shelf tools, as the post says. So I'll read this one sentence here. We're going to follow the path of least resistance at every step, obtaining a classifier that should look very familiar to anyone involved in current natural language processing. So in natural language processing, you can kind of assign sentiments to words and you end up training your system based on existing text out there. 
So let's scroll down and I'll let you read this article on your own. Some of the code will be quite approachable. Some of it will be using uh, some techniques that you may not be familiar with. But ultimately, I want to draw your attention to uh, kind of some of the uh, results. So we can see here some, a sample of 20 words. OK, so heartily gets a positive score versus scratchy gets a negative score. So we're looking at the sentiment scores here. Poorly gets a negative score and enchanting gets a positive score. So the more positive the, uh, the number, the more positive the sentiment, the more negative the number or the smaller the number, the uh, more negative the sentiment is the idea in this system. And then um, we can take a look at some of the um, examples. So Thomas Lumley gave some examples from uh, kind of sentences from the Middle Earth. Uh, they, they have a cave troll gives you something negative versus if more of us valued food and cheer and song uh, above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world gets a, a positive. So he uses this to say, OK, I think that this classifier is somehow working, that it is identifying things that have a positive connotation to humans as positive or sentiment and those that might have some, a negative connotation uh, with a negative sentiment. Now, let's take a look to see what it does with other words. So here is the punchline. Here's a sentence, the same sentence, and the only thing that's changing is the type of cuisine we're working with. Let's go out for Italian food. 1.38 is a sentiment. Let's go out for Chinese food, 1.04. And I want to draw your attention not to the exact numbers, but how these numbers rank versus let's go out for Mexican food and we're getting a much lower sentiment. So there is some implicit bias built into the system in terms of the data it's using to do this classification that's assigning a lower sentiment to the word Mexican compared to Italian and Chinese, and there's an ordering between these two. And note that this is the, the system is being built on um, the English language, so you know it's going to perpetuate whatever uh, the underlying data it's using. And also uh, here, Thomas doesn't reveal the uh, names of the uh, students in his class, but he did test these things with I'm a, my name is something and I'm a bank robber versus I'm a data scientist. And we can kind of see uh, how the sentiments actually vary. Uh, these are just uh, this AA and BB are just uh, kind of uh, blinded words, if you will. So there were actually real names there in the actual code. And we can see how the sentiment is changing simply by changing that one name. But we wouldn't actually as humans expect that to change because it's the same sentence and only the human's name is changing. So these are just some examples of how it's so easy to fall into this trap without even trying. But that is not defense ultimately you know that you need to be aware that this is possible if you let the uh, machine learning kind of do this in an unsupervised way so you as a data scientist building these systems need to be aware of this so that you can actually do something ahead of time and intervene and make sure that you're not building yet another system that's perpetuating uh, biases so if you're interested in reading more about these, I do very strongly recommend going through the ProPublica article in full. Um, it is a great read and it also works through some of the math of what's happening in the background as well. Um, there is a book called Ethics and Data Science. Uh, it's a nice overview of things. So that's one reason why I link to it. And specifically for this book, I link to the Amazon link because you can get it for free for a Kindle uh, reader or a Kindle app. So if you um, if you like reading things on the Kindle, this is something you can access for free there. Uh, Weapons of Math Destruction is a wonderful uh, book. Uh, well, wonderful. It, it, it highlights so many things that are not so wonderful, but written in such a wonderful way by Kathy O'Neill. Um, and one of her videos is uh, one of the videos I uh, picked for you to watch this week. And then um, another one I picked was from Sophia Umaja Noble, um, and the book is Algorithms of Oppression. Um, so uh, this one is about how search engines reinforce racism, both really, really interesting reads, very eye-opening in terms of what's happening uh, in the area of algorithmic bias. So if you wanna read the full length things, these are wonderful books to look at. And then the videos this week kind of give an overview of uh, the books as well.
Now, some parting thoughts for you. Uh, so at some point during your data science learning journey, you will learn tools that can be used unethically. You know, we've already learned some. We've talked about web scraping. We're going to be doing modeling and prediction next. Um, and you're probably going to learn more, especially if you're going, uh, you know, further down this path of uh, doing data science. You might also be tempted to use your knowledge in a way that's ethically questionable, either because of business goals or for the pursuit of further knowledge or because your boss told you so. So uh, my parting question for you, and again, I'm not going to give an answer, but more want to put this question in your mind is how do you train yourself to make the right decisions or reduce the likelihood of accidentally making the wrong decisions at those points? One quick answer I have for this, not the whole story, but a starting point is to educate yourself about things gone wrong. In the books that I, in the case studies that I highlighted and in the books and the videos that I recommended, there's all these, um, stories of things went wrong and in some of these you'll recognize that uh, the people building the system didn't even realize that things could get this out of hand so they've learned they've made a mistake even if it wasn't their intention and they've learned now it is not right to kind of repeat the same mistakes our job is to learn from what happened there and then make sure that we um, avoid them as you learn about these things you also get equipped with the knowledge to use your knowledge for evil as well and obviously we would hope that you don't do that but you might think of that as a personal decision i hope that uh, that's a decision you would take the right step on but as i highlighted here sometimes you might not be the decision maker perhaps your boss is asking you to do something and you're thinking this seems a little bit fishy so how do you actually train yourself to make the right decisions in those circumstances um, if you're interested in more of the doing good with data a uh, couple links here on the slide I would recommend that you uh, click through them if you're interested in this the Alan Turing Institute has a program as well as the University of Chicago they do summer internships on this if you're interested DataKind is an organization that brings high impact organizations together with leading data scientists to use data science in the service of humanity. They uh, run events uh, where they have these kind of like hackathon type things for uh, data for good. There's a lot of these out there. So I would uh, recommend that you are critical of some of these claims, but I think DataKind has been doing really, really good work in this area. So just finding out on what they work on might in fact be informative as well even if you don't end up participating and then if you're thinking about kind of both either yourself uh making a, a pledge to do better or at least finding out how people working in this area are making such pledges to do better i would recommend that you at least read the manifesto for data practices uh, whether you sign it or not is up to you but i think it's a nice framing of how people in the area of data science are thinking about good practices with data and i've given a lot of examples of uh things went wrong and things uh videos where things are highlighted where things go wrong uh, so if you would kind of want to put a positive spin on things as well um, and find out about what are the good things you can do with data this is another video that I would recommend uh, that you might watch in your own time this is from uh, one of the keynote presentations at USAR uh, the at annual R conference from back in 2019 where Julian Cornubis uh, gave a talk on AI for good in the R and Python ecosystem so he both talks about the computation considerations but also gives really great examples of the work that he and his organization have been involved in so it's a good watch if you're interested in finding out about what people are doing on the other side on the good side <laughs>